one of my friends, Eileen, woke up and she heard me singing in the bath. I think that was exactly the way I felt because over the few hours that I'd slept, I suddenly had a feeling of almost euphoric freedom. Oddly, Shirley Williams was singing about a defeat, one that helped to determine the rest of her political career. She had just lost her Stevenage seat in the 1979 general election. Former colleague Roy Hattersley saw her loss as an event of profound significance. I think the Shirley going in 79 had extraordinary consequences. It's just possible that had she remained in Parliament, the entire court of Labour Party history would have been changed. Williams was one of Labour's most popular cabinet ministers. Her defeat was the most dramatic constituency result on election night in 1979, when Margaret Thatcher was swept to power. Although Labour had lost the election, most of the big guns on the left and the right had been re-elected, ready to conduct a fiery post-mortem on the party's removal from power. Ironically, the minister with arguably the broadest appeal of the lot had failed to hold her seat. The outgoing Prime Minister, Jim Callaghan, spoke for many of his colleagues when he heard the news. I'm heartbroken. She is one of the most distinguished post-war parliamentarians. But Shirley is very young. She will be back again. But she did not come back, at least not in the way Callaghan had hoped. No, she was singing in the bath after the election, sensing liberation from a party that was about to embark on a stormy civil war. The early skirmishes had already started while she and Labour had still been in power. Activists had begun to protest about the betrayal of ministers that had been roused throughout the 1970s about whether Britain should be in Europe. Had the government not been left-wing enough? Should Labour now move leftwards? These were the other questions whirling around in the late 1970s. Williams could contemplate them from the safety of her bath, or at least from the distance of no longer being in the Commons. As Labour moved leftwards, her conclusions were dramatic. I suddenly felt you know, it's all opened up. Everything is now possible. And I got very thrilled by that. And I think one of the reasons for this was because having become more and more doubtful about some aspects of the Labour Party, I suddenly realised that I was now free to hammer out my own future and to criticise the Labour Party and the direction it was going in. And of course, the outcome of that thinking was to lead me towards thinking about creating or being part of the creation of a new party. In terms of Labour's civil war, Williams was firmly on the social democratic wing of the argument. At a party conference fringe meeting in 1980, she famously warned that there was a fascism of the left as well as of the right. On Europe, public ownership and internal reforms, she was moving away from what appeared to be the prevailing mood in the Labour Party. After 18 months of thinking, the new party took the form of the SDP, launched with the late Roy Jenkins, David Owen and William Rogers, the Gang of Four. To a blaze of publicity, the most senior figure in the new party, Jenkins, proclaimed a moment of history. It is the biggest break in the pattern of British politics for at least 60 years, for two generations. Williams was the pivotal figure in those early months because, as far as this could be measured, she appeared to have a wider following than the other members of the new gang. On the day after she defected, the Guardian newspaper published a short letter from a Labour supporter. Shirley Williams has left the Labour Party. Labour will not win an election for 10 years. The writer underestimated the length of Labour's exile. But the political analyst Ivor Crew, author of a book on the SDP, suggests that the broader assessment was correct. I think it was enormously important that Shirley Williams chose to leave the Labour Party. She had a very large following. Had she decided not to leave the Labour Party, then I really don't think that the SDP could have been formed. Her departure was absolutely critical to the initial success of the SDP. David Owen has also written that when Williams finally decided to join, the others really thought they had a chance of success. The emphasis there should be on the finally, as several accounts suggest that Williams found it especially painful to leave Labour. Does she accept she found the whole experience traumatic? For me, very deeply so. I mean, a great many of our friends, our closest associates, were in the Labour movement. For me, when I was a child, to go to a Labour Party conference was the mecca of my year. So it was very hard. And... Of course, for the first few years afterwards, we were in effect sent to Coventry. Friends that we'd had all our lives long would walk away from us. I remember at one point Roy Hattersley not crossing the road to say hello. And I had the feeling that, you know, we were really put in the doghouse. 
And it took a lot in those early years to stick that out, I mean, to simply be cast into the outer darkness. I know that Shirley believed that I felt very aggressive towards her. I didn't. I never felt animosity, just great sadness. Shirley was the Labour Party. She was the heart and soul of the Labour Party. And for her to leave was a savage blow. Had she been in the House of Commons, I don't think she would have left. I think the fact that she was outside the House of Commons made her less connected with the family of the Labour Party and therefore made it possible for her to leave in a way emotionally she wouldn't have felt possible had she still been a member of Parliament. It's just possible that had she remained in Parliament, Shirley Williams would have become leader of the Labour Party and the entire course of Labour Party history would have been changed. What of Williams herself? Had she had leadership ambitions before losing her seat? I suppose a thought crossed my mind when I stood against Michael Foote for deputy leadership, and although it's been forgotten in the midst of time, I did come actually surprisingly close to him, given that he was a generation older. And so it was when that happened, and I realised that I still had 25 years to go, that I thought I could become leader of the party, or at least it wasn't completely out of the question. And, of course, Harold Wilson had said the same thing to me. He'd said, you know, one day you'll be leader of this party. Uh, but I don't think I really thought about it seriously for very long. One of my few virtues is that I have no exaggerated sense of my own abilities and capacities. So I would have said there was a chance, let's say one in four, but not much higher than that. But her election defeat in 1979 and Labour's swing to the left meant that Williams had moved on. In 1981, she contested the Crosby by-election as an SDP candidate, supported by other stars from the Gang of Four. Here is Shirley Williams. With Roy Jenkins, we're all here to say that Thursday can be a great day and a great day for Britain. The outcome was dramatic, more so than her defeat in 1979. Williams won with a comfortable majority, the first SDP member to win a by-election. Fleetingly, it appeared as if the SDP really could break the mould of British politics, terrifying both the Labour and Conservative parties. Williams was back, and this time, it was the satirist that was singing. What a splendid new statistic. What a simply smashing result. I was always optimistic, but they've turned me into a cult. On the 26th November, I was voted top of the pile. It's a day that I must remember, for I promised to change my style. I'll try to get... Again, she was linked with the leadership. The singers warned Roy Jenkins that now she had a seat, she had claims to be SDP leader. It's a most confusing mystery how I beat that butcher boy, but I've written a page of history, so it's jolly well, look out, Roy. Yet Williams was not entirely euphoric. She was uneasy about returning to Westminster, especially in her new political role. I didn't much like the Commons. I was also very conscious of the fact that if you were an SDP member, and I was the only elected one, you were going to be met by a barrage of hostility. So it was a very hard place to be, and I knew it was going to be a hard place to be, and having just fought an extremely fierce by-election, uh, which had taken you know, a month or so in the pouring rain, to come into an utterly unwelcoming House of Commons, well, you can hardly describe it as an attractive prospect. It wasn't, but it had to be done. But here is the curiosity of William's political career. It wasn't very long before she lost again. One of Britain's most popular politicians couldn't hold on to a seat for very long. In the 1983 general election, when the SDP Liberal Alliance nearly came second in terms of votes cast, Williams lost Crosby. In spite of the personal blow, she addressed her supporters at the count about their broader political achievement. You have established that we are breaking the mould, and we are a force, and we are a force that will never, never die until it consigns this country to a better future. In the early euphoric days, they hadn't envisaged this, that on election night, two of the stars, Jenkins and Owen, would be commiserating with the vanquished Williams live on Radio 4. Shirley. David, I, I'm congratulations. Well, I'm, I'm so, so delighted. So, well, thanks a lot, and thanks for all your help. But I, you did wonderfully well. I mean, given all the problems that you had in that seat, I think it's a tremendous result. But well, I, I know how sad you all must be in your workers, but give my love to them all. I will, and thank. I'm so glad you got back. I've got uh, Mr. Roy Jenkins on the line as well, so we can now have a triumvirate conversation. That's marvellous. Uh, Mr. You Jenkins. Are brilliant. Shirley, right. I'm terribly sorry, but I think it was one of the best results you could have achieved. It was an impossible seat. 
Um, to hold in the impossible seat meant that Williams was no longer in the House of Commons, and this time for good. Had she been returned in 1983, it's quite possible that she would have become leader of the SDP. As it was, David Owen acquired the crown and pursued a course that troubled and finally alienated Williams and indeed Jenkins. But politics isn't just about the bigger political picture, it's also personal. Williams had placed herself before the voters at another general election and lost for a second time. Was she singing in the bath again? I wasn't singing in the bath. It had been a hard job to win Crosby. And of course, what I began to realise was that the boundaries had been changed in a way that made it virtually impossible for me to win. So having conquered a 21,000 majority, to then find that the rules of the game were rigged against me made me rather bitter. You know, I would have won this constituency. I could have held it. I'd worked like mad there. Uh, and now it's been taken away from me by, you know, playing the cards. After that election, did you then think, well, time to step back a bit from the fray? Because, I mean, you you did in the sense that you went to, to Harvard soon afterwards, didn't you? Well, in the first, on the first round, after my, my loss in Stevenage, sure, I mean, I, my feeling was I've got to row back and think more about where I'm going. Um, in 83, it was harder because I realised that I was being pushed off the ship, that I was part of the rowers for, so to speak. But I did actually then take on the job of being president of the party. I didn't really pull out of politics. What I did was pull out of parliament. I was very busy politically, but it was more with the people than with parliament. And I didn't regret that. Do you feel any resentment, you know, on the what might have been? You might have been leader of the Labour Party if you had held the 79 seat. Uh, you might well have been leader of the SDP if you had held the 83 seat. So you could have been leader of two major national parties in certain circumstances. Do you ever reflect more broadly on, on that and the frustration of losing those two elections at pivotal times for your two different parties? Not really. I mean, I, I've become quite philosophic, I suppose. Uh, and I, I think I've always been fairly philosophic. I'm not, I'm, I mean, I tend to think, you know, God decides what we're going to do. So, no, I think what I've always felt when I've had these slightly jarring setbacks is to sort of look at another bit of my life and develop that. Finally, of course, many people would say, well, Shirley Williams would have been a fantastic member of the new Labour team. Have you ever thought... Blimey, I, I would have fitted in perfectly well with Tony Blair in the mid-90s. No, because I wouldn't have done. The degree of centralisation and control, I would have found very hard to put up with. I mean, when I was a cabinet minister, at least I had a pretty fair autonomy in my own department. And Jim inter interfered occasionally, Wilson never. I do think now, where number 10, in effect, has a great, and number 11, have a great deal to say about how ministers run their departments, I would actually have been rather unhappy. I don't think that would have suited me at all. I'd have gotten trouble like Claire Short. There are few political careers with so many what-ifs, but Shirley Williams shows no signs of bitterness or regret. If there is a message from her oscillating political career, it seems to be this. If you're a ferociously ambitious politician and have the talent to justify the ambition, for goodness sake, get a safe seat.